Hi, I'm David Matthews and I'm a reporter at Times Higher Education and I'm here with Nick Jennings who is recently appointed uh, Vice Provost for Research at Imperial College London. You've been in the job three months now but before then you've got a very interesting background in AI and cyber security. If you could just tell us briefly about uh, what, what you've been doing before your role at Imperial. Yes, so uh, immediately before I came to Imperial I, I've had two Ro roles concurrently. So firstly I've been the government's chief scientific advisor for national security and I've done that for the last six years and that's been sort of the main job that, that I've done during that time. In parallel to that and sort of before that um, I've been a professor of artificial intelligence and computer science at the University of Southampton and, and indeed I was the Regis Professor of Computer Science at, at the University of Southampton. So I undertook research in the broad area of artificial intelligence. Right. Okay. And in your new role at Imperial, you know, there's a lot of change happening at the university. There's a big expansion going on in the west of London. Can you tell us about, you know, wh what's going to happen to the university over the next five, ten years or so? So it's a very exciting opportunity that we have, and in fact, was one of the reasons that uh, one of the reasons that attracted me to Imperial. So we have bought uh, 25 acres of land around the White City area and we're going to build a new campus there and so this campus is going to be uh, an opportunity for us to build uh, to build an environment where we have lots of innovation going on lots of multidisciplinary research going on we have uh, lots of companies uh, uh, who are going to be situated there and sort of a really vibrant mix of that translation research that innovative culture and sort of multidisciplinary research and it really gives us a, a great opportunity it's a, the footprint in White City is about the same as we have in in South Kensington so for us it's a it's a real expansion and great opportunity for us yes it, I mean in in London you're seeing a few big universities expanding UCL is expanding east Imperial is sort of expanding west you, you, you're at the moment you're sort of hemmed in by quite expensive property in a way. Is, is that a problem for universities in, in London, do you think? We are in a very nice and, and very expensive area I in South Kensington, which is, which is fantastic, uh, but our room for expansion on the South Kensington site is, is very limited, and, and we're starting to be close to, to being full on that. So what we want to be able to do is to have another site where we can expand into to expand as we want as a as a university as we take on more students and as our research grows and as our entrepreneurial and innovation activities grow we can't fit all of that on the South Kensington site we have hospital sites where some of our medical research goes on but what we really needed was the big new expansion that we're, that White City op offers us okay and you you join as um, uh, vice provost for research at a time when a lot of questions in science over reproducibility, um, whether data is being made open uh, to be checked by the scientists, and you know questions in psychology and cancer research. Lots of fields about whether results we, we can actually rely on scientific results. Um, could you just you know run me through you know how serious you think the problem is and and also what you can do about it as a university. So my perception, uh, as I see, th see things, is that most most science, almost all publications that get produced, are are genuine uh, results. You, we do see uh, issues around reproducibility and sort of fabrication of, of results uh, in more than we used to. I think I'm unclear whether that's because now we're looking harder at those sorts of things or it's a genuine sort of increase in, in phenomena over time. I think what we, what's incumbent upon us as scientists is to make sure that we are producing our results and the data and any algorithms and any processing that we're putting with it, making sure that that goes alongside our publication. So there are many initiatives led by the funders and the, and, and the research councils and uh, our governing bodies to make sure that we do science I in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, I think that's really important. I think that's how you, how you address those issues, is, mm -hmm. is making them as transparent as you can, as putting data, putting codes alongside it, and, and really sort of doing the best that you can to, 
to make sure that your results are, are valid and seen to be valid and are, and are testable. Mm. Some critics say part of the problem is, is scientists chasing publications in big name journals and the solution to this is to make all publications open. Can universities force their own academics to actually uh, publish on open platforms or does it have to be funders instead do you think? I think universities have very limited scope for forcing their academics to to publish in a particular particular way, and I don't think I don't think that that's a, the way to go. I think funders, both uh, research council funders, so direct funders of individuals, and sort of the broader funding ecosystem through uh, UK research and innovation, can start to lay down some rules and indeed are starting to lay down some rules uh, about what needs to be made available, when it needs to be made available. So the th the for the next ref there's, there's certain sets of requirements that are likely to be required on our publications. Certain funders say that, that they must be available uh, within a particular time frame and I think that sort of regulatory framework is, is likely to influence behaviour more more than sort of individual universities. Okay, and, and just finally with your AI hat on, um, we've seen over the past few years numerous articles about how machines are going to be taking our jobs. We've had a few books more recently saying this isn't just people working on uh, you know, manufacturing lines and so on, low school jobs. This is actually going to eat into you know, lawyers, financial ad advisors and so on, uh, you know, the, the kind of jobs that universities hope graduates will do. And of course, the, you know, the, the, the potential is for the graduate earning premium to, to evaporate or at least be significantly eroded by this. I mean, first of all, you know, what, with your, uh, you know, uh, using your experience as an AI expert, do you think this is likely to, to happen? You know, how many jobs are going to be taken over the next 10, 20 years? And secondly, how can universities respond to this? Do they need to start teaching differently? Do they need to focus on core skills rather than, than content, for example? So I think now is a very exciting time for artificial intelligence. Uh, I've been an AI researcher for, for 30 years and I've seen it go through sort of various stages of that hype cycle from solving all, all our problems to solving none of our problems and being irrelevant. Now is a really good time uh, to be an, an AI researcher and there's lots of potential around and I think for me this is largely driven by the availability of lots of data that we have to be able to train our algorithms and the advances that have happened in processing power. There have been some algorithmic advances but sort of I see the the data and the processing power as, as being the dominant factor in those. So so AI is a, is a great technology uh, that can be used across a whole range of different areas. Now my take on it and what it's going to do so to society is that I do not believe that it's going to lead to the end of civilization as we know it or humanity. I also don't think it's going to uh, take away most jobs so that you know that we only have a few people working. For me AI is about smart processing of ever more amounts of of data that are being generated. I think some jobs will be displaced, so some that are not, some that do, that graduates are currently employed in, I think will disappear as automation and smart automation uh, comes more in into a whole range of different areas. But I still think that there'll, there'll be a whole host of jobs that get created around that, as has always happened uh, sort of uh, through the Industrial Revolution and sort of other big step changes like that. For me, I see AI mainly as being a, a replacement and a cognitive tool and enhancer for people doing jobs rather than mass replacement of those. So what that means for our education is I think we need to really focus on the, sort of the core skills that need to be taught in an area because the sort of specific technologies are going to change, they're going to change over time and individuals are going to have many more sort of career changes than, than they're used to at the moment. So I think sort of continual uh, learning is really important and sort of training in those fundamental transferable skills so that you understand the, the core principles of of, of an area rather than sort of just a, a narrow focus on things. Okay, well it sounds like we'll be in jobs for a while, whether that's a good or a bad thing uh, remains to be seen. So thank you very much for your time, Nick Jennings. Thank you. Thank you.